Welcome back. We're ready to take your calls. I've got my pencil retrieved, and we've got uh, Matthew Rosenblum here with me, who's a trial lawyer specializing in criminal defense ma matters, and we're going to take some more phone calls, okay? Let's, Let's go, go back to New York. John is on the line. He's a police officer. Hi, how are you today? Good. Yourself? Okay. What would you like to say to us? Uh, basically, I'd just like to say that uh, you guys were talking about Sergeant Taylor before and how he must have felt uh, trying to testify against his own, you know, one of his fellow officers. Right. I myself was just involved in a, a semi case where an officer supposedly hit a guy with a butt of his gun. Yeah. And it, it's it's tough. Uh, you do have to, you know, do what you have to do. You have to testify to to the court. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you feel bad being up there, and you see, you know, you see your one of your, your friend, your, you know, one of your fellow workers, yeah. you know, being uh, trouble and stuff. But I know it must be really tough, especially with the three officers facing the sergeant like that. And, yeah. Uh, well, can you give us a sense, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but can, can you give us a sense about whether you think that there'd ever be pressure to be brought against another officer to not testify against a fellow officer? Do you think there's sort of subtle or even direct pressure? Uh, you, there is. You, you will. There is pressure that, you know, your other officers, you know, say maybe, hey, why don't you, you know, try to take yeah, lighten care of up. something. Yeah. But, you know, it's, also, you got to remember something, too. This is your career. And you want to try to you know, tell the truth, because hopefully the truth will come out at the end. Yeah. That's the way I feel. And most of you know, most officers understand that and respect that. But don't you think there's also a tendency? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm asking the question. Do, do you think there's a tendency for people to say, "Listen, I just don't want to get involved unless I have to." I mean, if you if you force me to come to tr uh, to court, okay, I'll do what I can. But I'm not going to volunteer, and I'm certainly not going to go anywhere beyond where you're asking me the questions. Oh yeah, I could I could definitely see that. Definitely. Um, but you know, like I said, if it does come to where you do mm -hmm. have to go to court, where there's no other choice but have to go to court, and you have to tell the truth too, you don't want to catch yourself in a yeah. in a lie or or trying to fabricate any stories yeah. either. Yeah. John, stay on the line for a second, Matthew. You know, one of the issues that is often the case in trials is um, sometimes there's a feeling, and, and sometimes it can be on the other side of the room. Uh, that all the cops or all the paramedics or all the whatevers are ganged up uh, sort of in lockstep. Uh, it's almost as if sometimes um, everyone's talked to everyone, although of course they're not supposed to have it. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about how from a defense point of view, and this wouldn't be the case in this instance where the, the police are, are the defendants in the matter, how you try to break that down? Well, well it, uh, let me break your question down. Nobody likes to be a rat. Nobody likes to be considered a rat in their own minds. And nobody likes to be considered a rat uh, by friends or other people. Uh, but you, you, there is an obligation at some point in time, and you can be forced to testify or be yeah. uh, held in contempt. Uh, I just read the book, uh, The Client, which is a perfect example of an 11-year-old who was really forced to testify. Uh, many years ago, you had the Kitty Genovese case, where a woman was raped, I think, in Queens. And the neighbors, uh, instead of helping her, closed their windows so they couldn't hear her screams. Now, obviously, that's one case. Uh, on one extreme where you really have an obligation to, mm -hmm. to not only try to save her but to, to testify, to tell the police. On the other side, you have a guy you may be riding in a police car with him. He may have saved your car, may have saved your life uh, tens of millions of, of, of times or back, backed you up or whatever. And to be asked to testify against him may be a little more difficult and, and it becomes a little more blurry and a, and a lot more difficult. And I can sympathize with John the caller's uh, predicament. Yeah, and I suppose one of the things you try to do if you're a lawyer and you're trying to break down the witnesses, you suggest to the jury through some of the questions that this person, it's very hard for this person to be here testifying. And you don't want to be here, do you, testifying in this way, et cetera. And, and it gives the jury the sense that perhaps while the person may not be lying, the person isn't what you might call a willing witness. Well, if you want to bolster the credibility, you can say, on the one hand, they say he's a rat, but do you think it was easy for Mr. Jones to come in here and say that his friend is a liar, a cheat, a murderer, a rapist, or this or that? He's telling you it because it's the truth. Yeah. And yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I just wanted to get John's thought on something else. John, John as you watch this trial and you, as you hear the facts come out, and we've got more facts to go, we haven't heard from the defense yet, does it strike you that, that these police officers behaved appropriately when this man wouldn't open his hand, that, that the beating was uh, called for? I tell you, it's when you have a situation like that, it's a heated situation. You don't know what the guy has, has in his hand. You really don't know. Today, there's, there's so many guns out there, small guns that are very easily conceal, concealable mm -hmm. in your hand. You don't know what he has. Uh, possibly, they you know, could have thought it was the drugs. And if a person doesn't want to let go, after you tell him, tell him to let go, you start wrestling, fighting, mm 
You start and to get it's worried. A, yeah, and it's, yeah, it is. It's a heated yeah. situation. But and, was it know, the right thing to do? We know it's tough, but was it right? Was it right? What, what happened? Yeah. I, I really don't know. I wasn't there. And all I could say basically is that, you know, your adrenaline's flowing, you're, you're, you're very emotional, everything's high, and you're just trying to make sure you come out safe because you would like to go home after the tour. Yeah. Uh, basically, what it should have done was if the guy just let go of his hand, I mean, I don't know what was in it. Right. If he just let go of his hand, he would just probably been placed under arrest, and that would have been it. Yeah. But, you know, he, he, by him holding his hand tight like that, he was basically trying to have a little contest with the officers. So you're saying he escalated and controlled the situation, really? Oh, uh, yes, definitely. Definitely. If, well, a, if, you don't have a if a person does not want to listen to officers or doesn't want to be handcuffed, it's very tough trying to get a guy to uh, into handcuffs. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. Well, you know, it's interesting. A lot of these same issues raised on the defense side in the Rodney King trial as well, uh, where one of the defense lawyers, I'll never forget, in the first trial, Michael Stone stood up and said Rodney King was in charge of all of this. Rodney King could have stopped this beating at any point, and, and the jurors, when interviewed afterwards, all said that this was a very pivotal decision in their minds, so perhaps it will be here as well. Let's go to Pennsylvania. Doris Dorsey is on the phone line. Hi, Ms. Dorsey. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for calling us. What would you like to say? First of all, I would like to thank Court TV for bringing uh, these police brutality cases you're on, on the, the air. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? We can hear you're on the air. If you're trying to watch television, you're on a 10 second delay, so it'll just confuse you. Yes. Okay. Thank you for now, that. Now, the last, the last caller yep. is typical of not being upfront. Now, I watched the case of the so called White Boys Against Crime. Yeah, from Atlanta. And I heard the young attorney, the young uh, uh, prosecuting attorney, yes. make a statement to them that if it wasn't for policemen like them, it wouldn't be as much crime in the street. Mm -hmm. And I would like to add that if it wasn't for the mentality of, of policemen like the former caller mm -hmm. uh, uh, adhering to this thin blue line, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be the police brutality that there is. Now, I've, I've been watching this case. He never mentioned that both of these main characters have history Mm -hmm. of police brutality. This isn't the first time they've been in court. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are some people who will never believe it, and it is racial. I'm from Philadelphia, mm -hmm. of where I did attend city council meetings where we just got a civilian review board mm -hmm. that really doesn't have any teeth in it, but I feel that it is a start. You know? Step in the right and, direction. And, and uh, uh, when, when, when I heard a policeman from New York call in, on the white boys against crime mm -hmm. and try to give a, a, a character assessment of the policeman who used to be a policeman in New York right. after all the evidence that had been brought out in the trial. Mm -hmm. And I would say that these policemen that don't want to admit what they see, the policeman that just called was very reluctant, you know, mm -hmm. to admit that these policemen were wrong. Yeah. And this doctoring and trying to find out if he had a criminal record mm -hmm. so they could justify this unjustified beating. Yeah, you're, you're talking about whether or not Malice Green had a criminal record, and that and was one of the things. Yeah, well, uh, apparently he had some trouble with the law. Nothing in uh, the Detroit area yeah, at that but point. They, but they didn't get what they right. wanted. They didn't get what they wanted. That's that's quite right. It, it, and 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 of course, in a sense, the point is it doesn't matter what they found out after afterwards in, in a sense and we'll talk to matthew rosenblum about this in a sense if the police officers are able to find that mr green has a record as long as your arm afterward it doesn't do anything to help them in terms of what they did at the time if they had known uh, that he had had several convictions on various things before it might have helped in their defense but well, if they know after it really doesn't help well, does well, it? if you're talking about self-defense you're talking about uh, in new york uh, someone being fearing in their own minds being placed in imminent fear so if I know, for example, Cynthia, you have a, a record of murder in Texas, uh, and I'm in a situation like that with you, that might put the fear in my mind that would justify mm -hmm. a more uh, militant uh, action towards you. Um, getting back to the uh, listener, though, uh, this, this and your question, it would be irrelevant if they found the, you can't take the, the fear you find out at 10 o'clock and say, oh yeah, that's what mm -hmm. I was thinking at 8 o'clock, uh, and it has to be a reasonable fear. Getting back to the caller, uh, you know, uh, some of uh, people I've defended have been police officers. Some of the people I've defended have been people who have been victims of brutality by police officers. 
people are people. There are good listeners, there are bad listeners, there are good cops, there are bad cops, there are good commentators, there are bad commentators, there are uh, good guests, there are bad guests. You can't make a decision like uh, a, a blanket statement like that. That's one of the problems with the media, and that's one of the things I think that in court TV helps, helps to do is to show we have people, real life people, they make mistakes. The question is, in this case, was it a criminal mistake or was it just a bad judgment mistake? Absolutely. Well, that's uh, what this trial is trying to decide. Teddy Littell from Michigan is on the phone line. Hi, how are you? All right, how are you? Okay. What would you like to say to us? Okay, I have a quick question. Please. Okay, not like the uh, beating in uh, uh, Los Angeles with Rodney King. Right. Okay, this is a different matter. Between the two cases, you know how the officers got acquitted and right. they went back to court for the civil rights. Right. I was wondering if it's going to... By, by your legal experience, if it's going to be like that here, are you they going mean to be if there's an, Yeah. Well, or, if there's an acquittal, could there be federal charges, I guess, is the second part of the question. Right. Well, 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 let me ask you a question first, and then I'll try to respond to it. What, what's your sense of what the outcome should be from what you've seen so far? What I've seen so far? Well, as far, as far as Officer Left now, I haven't heard nothing about him. So let's put him aside for a moment. Right. Um, between what I've heard between EMS workers and the witnesses, right. I think it is a guilty verdict. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my right. And, we, and, and right, and we hesitate. We, we say willingly that you haven't heard the defense yet, and you, you, you say right. that as well. Right. Well, it, it, l l let's go to your point. Uh, if, if there were to be an acquittal, and at this point, I must say, it strikes me that particularly with Officer uh, uh, Budson uh, and Officer uh, Nevers, perhaps to a bit lesser extent, Mm -hmm. who, it strikes me that the defense is going to have to do some very serious work right. uh, over the next week or so in order to be able to bolster the defense theory. I think those phone communications yesterday really hurt the defense. I don't mm -hmm. know if you saw those, but you know when the defense leads by saying, we're going to explain to you how the reason this car was stopped, the reason Mr. Green was stopped is because these police officers in good faith stopped that they thought that they were stopping a car that they thought uh, had reason to reasonably believe had been stolen. And then you find out that four hours earlier they had found that that car had already been stopped and was under surveillance. I think that's going to be a real hurdle for the defense to overcome. Right. So, you know, I think there are enough things, including the eyewitnesses and the EMTs, to make those cases real tough. Uh, we'll see what happens with uh, uh, Mr. Lesnow's case, although, as we all saw yesterday, Matthew Rosenblum uh, uh, and I were talking about it before the program. Uh, uh, his lawyer, Mr. Walker, had some troubles in court yesterday, and whether or not uh, he's going to have some troubles based on some of the uh, false steps of his attorney is, is going to be an interesting question. Um, my sense, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Whether or not there could be federal charges, it strikes me they would have to then decide that this was based on race uh, in order to fall within the, the statute, the federal statute, which the second Rodney King trial came under. And so far, there have been no allegations that this was racially motivated. If there were, then they could bring charges, uh, presumably the same way uh, that the uh, federal government did in Los Angeles. So the answer is, uh, I don't know what the outcome is, and it's possible that if there's a, an acquittal, there could be a second trial as well. Uh, Matthew, would you like to comment? Uh, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think that this is the time to think about it. I, if my memory uh, is correct, I think there were some allegations of race. I think in one of the statements from one of the witnesses, he said they, they uh, didn't use the language he used to right, refer well, to a black Native American, they they didn't right. use uh, that language. So, and I think but it, that the was case nothing about the, 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 the. But it wasn't about the, the either malice green. These were other remarks outside the. Right, the prosecutors but I think, haven't made their case. Let's let's put look, it that way. Let, let's put it this way. Unless unless Mr. Bachelor, Mr. Goldpower, Mr. Walker uh, have something more for us, if they're right. going to put a case on and they're not required to do so, I don't think we're going to reach that problem. Yeah. You, you, this, uh, so far, the prosecution's case has been pretty strong. It's been pretty strong. Uh, they've been dense in it, but uh, the case reminds me of, of uh, the defense strategy, and maybe we'll get into this later, uh, doesn't seems to be a co seem to be a cohesive strategy, and it seems like they're all up there. I don't know if you've ever played ping pong, but sometimes you have one you could slam and you might miss it, or you can just put a little dink over the net and, and the other guy's not going to get the point. There have been many opportunities where they could have eased up on the witnesses, just hit the ball very lightly and made it, but they keep slamming it all over the place and they're missing half the slams, and it doesn't seem like th they have the points in mind that they want to make. So I think they've got problems amongst themselves, and they may be, who knows, Mr. Batch, uh, Mr. Bachelor's client may take the stand and say it was yeah. Goldpaw's client. Mr. Nevis may take the stand and say it was uh, 
Mr. the bachelor's Absolutely. science. Absolutely, and, and it's one of the reasons that it makes this all so interesting is that there were these three trials taking place at once. We'll talk a little bit more about this defense strategy, which is an important point. Uh, Eileen Murphy from New York. Hi. How are you? You're on the phone line with us, live on the air. Okay. How are you? Fine. Good. What would you like to say? I'd like to ask what's going to happen to these cops when they get acquitted. I think that the young guy is definitely going to get off, and you I have a feeling that... Well, we haven't, seen, we haven't seen the case against him yet. Well, though. I have a feeling that these other two guys, you know, everything that I've watched, I haven't... He, they chased everybody away who really could have watched what the hell was happening. Mm -hmm. And well, I, I just have a feeling that... They're going to be acquitted. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Did you see the, uh, much of the EMT testimony or the eyewitness? Well, I saw part of it, but I, I you know, I, I heard uh, only very briefly, and I, I wondered why they put him on right up front. Yeah. Well, I guess the reason they put him on first, at least the best we can figure out, is that they felt the EMT witnesses were the strongest witnesses because they were professionals who had arrived at the do scene. Do they have another EMT tech that's going to They do. It? There's one other they're holding okay, back. So that probably is what's going to tie it all together. That's part of my question. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder what will happen to these guys. They've already been bounced off the force. Right. And they've been suspended, correct. And, and actually, I, I think they they've were been fired. finally... I didn't I think, even think they were suspended. I, I think you're right. I think they have been finally fired. Now, what happens to them if well, they're acquitted? If they're acquitted, of course, they then potentially have actions against the city for wrongful dismissal. And, and Matthew, I mean, more lawyers will yet get involved if they're acquitted. They could seek well, to have their jobs And reinstated. I'll tell you this from based on experience. We had a rape case... Uh, Eric tried the case. The jury was out maybe uh, a half hour, an hour, to the best of my recollection. The guy was acquitted, and it's some three or four years later, and he still hasn't gotten his job back. He's just about to be reinstated. He's driving a bus for a while. Uh, it's not so easy, uh, despite the fact that you're acquitted, because you're, when you're acquitted, it means you were not found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It doesn't exactly mean you didn't do it. You have a different standard to try and fight and get your job back. Just getting back to, uh, if we have time, uh, uh, the question before and this listener's uh, question, uh, you have an interesting situation here. If indeed uh, less now, if there's no right. evidence against them, you have a, a kind of unique situation. It's kind of a weird legal situation where I, I believe that it's uh, Walker works for Goldpaw. Goldpaw. Uh, Perhaps we could have Mr. Les now take the stand, who really, uh, by all means, hasn't really done anything wrong, and carry the day for Gold Pond, po possibly uh, Bachelor. You got a guy who's relatively clean, uh, who could speak for all three of them, mm -hmm. and uh, that could be uh, what's happening here. Well, it's interesting, a and I think Kristen Jeanette Meyer's sense, and we'll talk to our reporter on the scene a little bit. Her sense is that there is quite a case against Les now. We just haven't seen it yet. But your point's well taken, and we covered this uh, police crime ring in Atlanta, the trial there. It's exactly what they did. Three defendants, they had the defendant they thought was the cleanest, take the stand, try to carry the day for everybody, and everybody was convicted. And everybody faced life, and uh, they got uh, much less than that. But it's, it's, it's interesting. Lots of these uh, things, we see patterns repeating themselves in courtrooms around the country. We thank you for your phone calls. We're going to do a, a brief uh, phone call segment today. We're going to take a commercial break. When we come back, we want to update you on a, a trial here in New York of a very important nature, which has really riveted the attention of uh, New York City. We'll give you an update on that and then uh, show you a little bit of what happened in court this morning, all before they come back live at about 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Stay with us.